Welcome back to the Life Money Balance Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Preston Cherry, where we let your life lead your money, not your money lead your life, where your life and money are working concurrently to help you achieve the life that you want and live fully. All right, we are going to start just chopping it up immediately. Oh my goodness, we got a special guest today. Often I get a question from some of our high income and high asset clients and they asked, well, we got all these buckets checked off, these are off, the, off the, the list, right? And they ask, well, what's next? And sometimes I say, well, more of the same, <laughs> but sometimes it's like, okay, well, what's the next best idea? Where can I place some money, you know, other than the financial markets? And who best to go to than one of my great friends, Miss Saint Shana Sissel from Bondrian Capital, CEO over there. Shana, we're always running to each other, so I'm glad to have you, have you on the show. Thank you for coming. It's, it's taken far too long for me to get on the show, but I'm happy to be here. Oh, uh, well, always an open invite, particularly to chop it up about investments. Yes. Right? And here at Concurrent, we're always having uh, you know investment meetings, and we partner up with firms like yourself in order to provide our clients with alternative investment ideas. Look, I told you at the shower, we're going to uh, fog up our glasses. But yeah, we're for, for investment ideas. And today we're sort of chop it up about what some of those ideas are and what people consider as, you know, alternative investments or alts. So let's lead with that. Shana, what are alts? So alts is a very vast category. It's a vast universe of opportunities. Um, it's really a lot easier to define what they aren't than what they are. It's so cliche. I think there's a whole bunch of us that say that, but it's true. Um, they're really just anything that's not your traditional long only publicly traded equity or your traditional long only publicly traded fixed income. Everything else is alts. Uh, so, you know, like I said, it's a vast universe that includes everything from private equity, private credit to hedge funds to collectibles. And we can go on and on. But all of that falls into the category of alternatives. Yeah. Isn't that cool? The, the, this most simpler uh, definition is, is you have your traditional investments that are in the market, stocks, like you said, stocks and bonds, uh, traditional stock and bonds. You have ETFs and all that. You have everything that's in the financial markets. and Anything that's not that is an alt. Correct. <laughs> right. So you don't you don't even have to uh, go down the list of of alts, which we'll we'll chime in on a few of them today. But mm -hmm. as far as the definition is, is just if it's not that, then it's this. Yeah. <laughs> but pretty much. Now, uh, when we're talking about portfolio construction, the uh, kind of like the traditional approach is you have a you know, buy and hold strategy. Folks are familiar with 60, 40, and that's kind of like percentage of equities to, to bonds or wherever you are on the risk profile, you can go up to hundred percent as far as equity is concerned. And then, and that's your core portfolio as we like to call it. And then you have your satellite portfolio, which is some of your best ideas, maybe some individual stocks and your core portfolio can also be your alt portfolio, but more than likely your alt portfolio is existing outside of the financial markets. So um, what, what, what have you run into when you're talking about alts and how to position them in the portfolio? Well, it really, it depends. So, you know, not to make it more complicated, but, um, you know, it depends where it fits in your portfolio. So private equity is equity and it is uh, correlated to traditional public equity. So it belongs in your equity bucket, private credit, it's the same thing. It's credit. It's fixed income. It's just private, not public, but it still has correlations and still behaves very similarly to traditional fixed income. So it belongs in your fixed income bucket. And then there's what I like to call the diversifying alternative bucket. And these are things that are like hedge fund strategies, long short, market neutral, hedged equity, options based, um, any kind of levered product, Bitcoin, gold, private real estate, sports rights, collectibles, um, 
housing developments. Like I could go on and on and on. There's all sorts of things that fall into that diversifying bucket thing. And these are things that are like hedge fund strategies, long short, market neutral, hedged equity, that don't actually correlate with traditional markets. And that brings something to your portfolio that's different. Um, they're not going to behave in line necessarily with the broader markets. And so they can uh, reduce the risk in your overall portfolio. And then the conversation becomes less about, you know, what kind of risk am I bringing on and more about liquidity. Um, and then um, there are lots of options in those buckets, too. So alternatives have become more and more available to everybody. Um, you know, you touched on ETFs being part of like the traditional financial markets, and that's definitely true. But there are ETFs that are implementing alternative strategies. So they have complete liquidity, but they give you the diversifying benefits of alternatives. Um, and then there's interval funds, which allow everybody, uh, including the general public to um, access like private equity and private credit, things that don't have daily liquidity, um, but in a wrapper that everybody can access. And those things, again, can go into different buckets depending what the underlying is. So, you know, it really depends on what you're le looking to achieve. I like to say that for advisors, there's two key conversations you need to have. You know, for some of your ultra high net worth individuals that understand private markets, um, they'll want private equity and private credit because they understand that because they are, quote, private, um, there's less efficiency in those markets and more opportunity for excess returns. But those are liquidity conversations because they belong in your equity and fixed income buckets. And then it's about how much of those buckets am I comfortable having illiquidity in? And then when you talk about the diversifying buckets, you can talk about the risk management opportunities there with things like managed futures and global macro and market neutral, hedged equity. And then you can also talk about things that I like to call ego investing. Things that your clients will connect with on a personal level. And I always use sports rights because it, it just seems to resonate with everyone. But sports rights is this idea of having private equity ownership in a sports team. Now, sports, even though it's called private equity, it, it, sports in general don't behave like traditional equities. And we can go down that rabbit hole if you'd like. But um, the idea for, of somebody of owning a piece of the ownership of their favorite sports team has a personal connection. And there's things like workforce housing that people connect with, um, development of, um, you know, rehabs of things in their own community, um, private financing of certain underrepresented minority groups, things of that nature. Then you start to have these connections that people build with these underlying investments. And again, that's outside of the traditional market. So I kind of look at it as those two conversations. We have the conversation about you know, your private equity, private credit, which I think everybody kind of understands the value there, but venture capital, things of that nature. And then when you get into this diversifying bucket, there's opportunities to not only manage risk in client portfolios through these low correlation um, uh, investment opportunities, um, but also these opportunities to have personal connections with the underlying investments that you're making in that bucket as well. Yes, I, I, I like that that path that you lined up there. Because when folks talk about their alternative investments, either uh, they're the, the clients, the consumer, or say institutionals that have an investment policy statement, they're outlining you know, what their values are, what their time horizon is, what their mm -hmm. risk profile, uh, what their capability, it, it, risk tolerance and capability are two different things, right? So mixing all of this in, like you said, having a connective value, uh, you know, connective position to your investments is very powerful. Just like Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin is mm -hmm. like that sometimes, right? Yes, and absolutely. So, and and so mixing it all together would would steer someone into one of these three categories that you're talking about, like where it, whether it be equity like or diversifier or ego. So it is a right. conversation of what your intent, what your purpose is, and where you are with your investment style. Is that, does that ring a bell? No, absolutely. And I think that that's actually where the opportunity lies. You know, there's a number of studies that have come out recently. I'm going to just throw some stats out at you. 75% um, of financial advisors don't actually allocate to alternatives. The ones that do are allocating somewhere between five and 7%. Um, for reference, the average institution is doing 25 to 30%. Now, 
their liquidity needs are quite different. And so there's some considerations you need to take. But when you think about it, if only 25% of advisors are allocating to the space and only allocating 5 to 7%, there's a huge opportunity here to have uh, discussions with your clients, right? Uh, to differentiate yourself from your peers. So where's the best way to start that? It's typically not in these conversations where, you know, you're talking about broad private equity and, you know, the Carlisles and the Blackstones of the world. You know, everybody can get that now. Uh, there's plenty of access on a number of different platforms. It's no longer gate kept in many ways. But the opportunity really lies in getting to know your client and to your point in their investment policy statements, talking about what they value what's important to them, what are their hobbies, what are they passionate about, and then going and finding investments that are not only good investments, but things that kind of align with those things. So we talk sports rights, other opportunities, things like wine, bourbon, sports, uh, baseball cards. That one's kind of out there, but you get my drift. There's these I got opportunities. Some, I got some baseball cards, Shana. I got some. <laughs> well, those ones are a little rarer, um, yeah. but they exist. Things yeah. like music rights, yeah. Um, but it doesn't even have to be things like ego related, like those things. It can be things about wanting to make your neighborhood or your community a better place through investing in workforce housing initiatives and in your to have more affordable housing for the folks in your community. It can be rehab instead of teardown kind of um, real estate development opportunities. It can be about, you know, bringing um better resources to under uh, to poorer neighborhoods. It can be so many different things. It can be helping finance female entrepreneurs or uh, minority entrepreneurs uh, through certain types of venture funds. There's a number of different ways you can do it where you can feel like you're actually having impact on your community or on the things that are important to you. And then there's also the opportunity to invest in things that you just are passionate about, like sports, like wine, like baseball cards. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that if it's some some of the things that you're talking about, like investing in your communities and just having these values aligned investments uh, mm -hmm. outside of your core portfolio and saying what what piques my interest? What am like you said, passionate about? Uh, how do I want to allocate my do dollars? Uh, I say often life and money alignment gives your money assignments. And so when you're talking about uh, SRI, which is socially responsible investing, then you can invest in those areas when you have um, you know, dollars that you can allocate toward those areas and not give up on returns. So often folks say uh, that just if you're if you're investing in, say, ESG or SRI, then you're you're going to have to take a haircut on long term returns. And that's that hasn't been proven in the data. No, it hasn't, because usually if you're investing aligned with principles, um, you're investing in high quality management who are making good decisions that are doing good things for their communities. It doesn't necessarily uh, translate to, oh, if you're investing um, for social in a socially responsible way, that somehow that's a bad way to run a company. I mean, it, it really comes down to what you define as socially responsible and everybody's is different. You know, some people value different things. So perfect example of this is if you want to just pick on a stock is Tesla. So Tesla, a lot of people look at as a environmentally friendly company because of the uh, EV aspects. But then there are others who would say, well, you know, it's not environmentally friendly because of the types of uh, things that go into the batteries, or um, they look at the the environment at Tesla, like the culture, and they don't like it because of Elon Musk. So like, you can look at the same stock and five people can have a different opinion on whether or not it is a socially responsible or ESG name. And that has been the problem with the concept since the beginning. But I like to think that if you know your client and you know what their values are, then you can better align them with those ideas and um, create what is socially responsible for them based on their values or connect them with investments that are going to um, be related to something they're passionate about based on their hobbies and interests and values and things that they just enjoy. You know, there's so many different ways, but I like to think that alternatives are really the only space you can do that, right? Because everybody can give you a fidelity model. Nobody is particularly um, attached to or excited about the S&P 500. Um, 
And I think if you approach it in that way and you approach it in a way where you're trying to help your clients align their investments with the things that are important to them, A, you're having better conversations with your clients and getting to know them better um, on a deeper level, which in, in proves um, the client's uh, retention. Um, so that's good. Um, but B, um, the conversations that advisors typically find difficult about complexity and liquidity and fees go away because there's not as big a concern about those things when you're aligning it with interests, values, uh, passions, and things of that nature. Uh, it, it just does not become the focus of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, for sure, when we're talking with our clients here at Concurrent, we're definitely having the alternative conversation because it, folks are checking off the boxes of order or operations as far as their uh, as far as their investment approach. And that what's next conversation comes up a lot now. Uh, and, and towards their, to, to your point, towards their preferences and, and where they are as far as their uh, life cycle and investment life cycle as well. Now, you mentioned a couple of things, right? Access to access to alts. Now, I used to be a wholesaler back in the day, and like you said, that alternatives are now being wrapped, so to speak. They're they're being presented like a like a like a we say wrapper, like a like a Christmas gift. They got the little wrapping paper on it in an ETF wrapper. So one of the ideas was, uh, I believe it was uh, master limited partnerships, where it was a pipeline approach as far as traveling uh, gas and oil for going through the pipelines. Another one was risk parity, where you had these uh, uh, different risk profiles and all this. So you, you mentioned that uh, access is very is a little bit easier now. And you can you can slide these, uh, I guess, alternative wrappers inside of that. Uh, I guess what was that that uh, cord, that satellite bucket a little easier now, right? Yes, absolutely. I like to tell advisors, you know, we've talked about the benefits to your clients and the way that you can improve your relationship, potentially bring in more assets and improve client retention using alts. But I also like to say that, you know, we've learned over the last, you know, decade plus that equities have traditionally outperformed. We've seen unbelievably strong equity returns. Um, but equities have probably the broadest amount of risk of any asset class. Um, you know, and we can get into the nuances of that. And then people typically have fixed income as like their downside protection for income and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, you know, people will say the 60-40 is dead. I like to say it's evolving. Um, if you incorporate alts into your mix, and a lot of people are like, where does it come from? There's this whole concept of return stacking that Corey Hofstein um from newfound research really talks about, but um, Jeremy Schwartz at Wisdom Tree has started talking about it as well. And there are others. This idea of return stacking is like, where do I take it from? Because I don't want to take it from equities. And if I just take it from bonds, am I losing the income opportunity there too? Um, so there's more and more uh, tools uh, coming out, whether it be through newfound research, Corey's firm or Wisdom Tree or others with this idea of providing you a resource to kind of stack up your returns so you get 100% 60-40 exposure with only 80% of your portfolio. Um, I like to add alts in there because what happens is alts are inherently diversifying. And if you look at the academic research, and I hate talking about academic research because sometimes everything works in academic research, but not in real life. But in this case, it actually works in real life too diversifying alternatives like those hedge fund strategies, the ones that you'll most commonly find in an ETF wrapper um, or in a hedge fund. They have much better liquidity because they're really just taking public market um, instruments and um, long short or using an option overlay or something to that extent to kind of create um, a different type of exposure. Um, they can actually reduce the risk of your portfolio. Now, they will improve your returns somewhat. Um, I like to say nothing anybody is going to get excited about. I think on average, if you put 20% in an alts bucket of these diversifying kind of alts, you might see 25 to 50 basis points improvement in your annualized returns. It is nothing to write home about. But what you do see is a substantial decrease in the overall risk of the portfolio. So when I worked um, as a CIO for an RAA, one of the things I used to do is create risk budgets, right? So like we would give every type of instrument we could invest in a score. Um, and um, then we would you know, put them together in a portfolio, add up the score, and then that was our budget. And what ended up happening was we would have 
let's say for an aggressive portfolio risk score of 100. And if I added um, alternatives in it, um, I would get similar returns, but I would have a like the risk of the portfolio would be far less than the risk budget that I had to work with, which means now that I have extra money or extra risk I can take where I'm more likely to get strong returns. I think there's a misconception that alternatives is going to be better returns than traditional markets. And I think there is some of that and some of like private equity, venture capital specifically, um, if you invest with the right VCs, um, somewhat in private credit as well, especially distressed at certain points in the economic cycle. But um, overall, the benefit of alts is not necessarily that they are going to have so much better return. It's actually that they can remove overall risk of the portfolio. So you can take greater risks in the places it's most likely to to pay off. And that, that I think is often missed and the opportunity there, you can have more in video, you can do more in Bitcoin and, and things of that nature because you have this risk budget without taking too much risk or uh, stepping over the risk budget you have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and for, for those that may be unfamiliar with risk budget, it's just smoothing out your volatility and your and your portfolio over time because there's there's volatile markets inside of a year you know uh, you know you you, you don't want to just uh, be looking at your portfolio all the time strictly month by month um, perhaps quarter by quarter uh, that those markets fluctuations are going fluctuations are going to happen however over time though two three five seven ten years how does that portfolio uh, feel to you uh, and I'm talking to the people that are listening how's that portfolio feel to is it moving way up and down these these uh, these now if it goes up all the time that's that's fantastic but it doesn't happen like that but what about those those uh those jolts right that down all right how does that feel to you now if you were able to smooth that just a little bit uh, cutting a little bit of downside risk off of that and place your portfolio perhaps in a different range of joltness <laughs> to put it in a everyday term then that alts can provide that sometimes you know that that smoothing effect because when one when, when your portfolio is going one way an alternative could perhaps pull it another way and just smooth it out a little bit so that's what you were talking about our risk budget exactly right? the perfect example of that is something like managed futures managed futures never perform well when the market's doing great they end up being the thing your client fixates on but you know, a small position in managed futures like 5% um, to an overall portfolio actually can reduce the risk of the portfolio. And to your point, because when equities tend not to be working, managed futures tend to be working. Um, so they can kind of smooth that effect out. You know, the smoothing effect can mean a lot of different things. But in this case, to your point, it's all about, you know, how much can I handle the ups and downs? I like to say, and I know a lot of advisors say this, um, the best portfolio is the one that you can stick with, not the one that's going to give you the optimal return. Because at the end of the day, it only gives you the optimal return if you stay invested. But if you can't stay invested, then it's not the best portfolio for you and you're not going to get the optimal return. So using alts can really provide a better you know, overall ride towards meeting your goals. Um, and there's a number of different ways to do that. There's an aspect of that even in the illiquid stuff, right? You know, Cliff Asness calls it volatility laundering. The actual appropriate industry term is the smoothing effect. But because these things do not actually mark to market, they don't have a daily uh, net asset value. Um, they're only calculated on a monthly or quarterly or semi-annual basis. You don't see the movements in the return stream. And so there's like almost from a psychological standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint, um, some the comfort in the fact that you're not seeing the ups and downs. Just think about it. If you don't log into your brokerage account for like two weeks, um, how how much less anxious you are if the market is, you know, taking a turn uh, and not in the right way. Um, if you're not looking at your account every day, you're not freaking out about that. And it's the same kind of idea. Now, obviously, it's artificial in many ways, but sometimes I think, you know, there's benefits to that as well, um, and that it does smooth out the ride at least in and the experience of the client by looking at their statements, you know, we can have an argument. Um, like I've, I've had this debate with Cliff Asness about, you know, you're basically just removing volatility artificially, but 
however way you're doing it, it does make the ride a little smoother in terms of the anxiety your client might feel from an ups and downs on a daily and hourly basis. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of themes I, I like to pass on to the audience, which as far as alter concern is, uh, you know, your your readiness, okay, which is your access to alts, your preparation for illiquidity and your time horizon and the return expectation. And if you look at that menu, then you can better assess whether alts are for you, where they fit your portfolio and your appetite for patience in order to potentially get a higher return over time. And what do I mean by that? And I want to hear your thoughts too, which is uh, some folks are ready for, uh, as far as uh, alternative investments like private equity, venture capital, which <laughs> there's only a few unicorns out there, <laughs> which people yeah. need to know, right? And they're not, they're not essentially ready for that illiquidity period or that first couple of two or three years where even five, sometimes seven, to where you may not have access to, to your money, you may not want access to your money because you have to uh, get through a period to where that money is incubating a little bit, waiting for that venture, waiting for that private equity project in order to uh, pay off some returns later on and down the line. So time horizon, access, illiquidity, and return profile. Let, 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 comment on that a little bit, because some people think they want some uh, some alts, but not ready for it. So I like to say that the conversation is about liquidity budget. Like, what? How much of your portfolio would you be comfortable with keeping completely illiquid and not having access to for an extended period of time? I would argue it's usually around ten percent. Um, but also, you can have a conversation about vehicle structure too, right? So like, I like to say there are interval funds that have LP private fund options alongside. Um, and sometimes if you look at the liquidity of the two structures, one has better secondary market liquidity or, um, you know, better overall terms to the client in terms of what the liquidity, um, constraints are. Um, for example, an evergreen private credit fund, um, that's in an LP structure might have a, quarterly, uh, but you could get all your money out as long as you gave, you know, 60 days notice, right? But an interval fund is also quarterly, but doesn't have the ability to get your money out, all of it, um, every quarter with any notice. The interval funds have a very different structure. It's, they're only allowed to have so much of the overall uh, NAV of the portfolio available for liquidity, and it's never going to allow you to take all your money out at the same time all things being equal, it might make better sense to be in the private fund vehicle than the interval fund. Some people don't have the private fund as an option because they don't meet the uh, accreditation standards. But um, those conversations we can now have because there are different ways to get this exposure. I always like to remind people though, even though you can get things in all kinds of wrappers, just always be really thoughtful about does the wrapper make sense, right? So I might shoot myself in the foot here because you know we're working towards some agreements with uh, you know some of the larger um, big alternative firms that are out there. But there was recently a um, filing for uh, State Street and Apollo to create a private credit ETF, but it's still private credit and it still doesn't have the ability to strike a NAV on a daily basis. So how exactly does that work? I would argue, even though it could be done in an ETF, even if it got approved as an ETF. And really good liquid markets, when everything's going great, sure, you might be able to have that kind of liquidity. However, in time of stress, you won't. And there have been mutual funds that had little pockets of illiquid uh, assets in them. Third Avenue in 2012 is the one I like to point out, that in a stressful time, weren't able to provide liquidity as a result of that. So, you know, just because something can be done doesn't mean that it should be done. And just because your client can access something doesn't mean they should access something. It's always a conversation about what they're comfortable with and what liquidity terms they're comfortable with. Just because you can get them private equity in an interval fund does not mean they should have private equity in an interval fund if they're not comfortable with having a liquidity of any kind. And that understanding that the interval fund doesn't will never have the opportunity for them to get 100% of their investment out if they need it in a panic. Maybe they shouldn't be in private equity if that's the case, 
because private equity should never be done in a daily liquid form because then it wouldn't have the benefits of private equity, of private markets. And so there's all these things to consider, but it all starts with a discussion about liquidity budgets. How much of your assets are you comfortable not being able to tap into for a period of five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years kind of thing? And sometimes Absolutely. it's a good thing, right? If you know your client's saving for a certain goal and it's 20 years down the road and you don't want them to ever be like tempted to like, you know, panic or something, sometimes having that illiquidity is a good thing, but you also have to consider their overall environment, what kind of liquid assets they have in a case of an emergency, a health issue, um, all kinds of things can come up and you, all of those things need to be part of the conversation. Absolutely. I think that's where when folks have that what's next conversation with their advisor and their firm that they're uh, partnering with, partnering with, then does that firm, does that advisor have access like we're talking to today? Uh, have they had the conversation holistically about all the things that we've talked today, whether it be value system, access, liquidity, uh, menu of, of options? We've talked about a lot and, and some interesting aspects of of what alts are and what's on that menu and also time horizon risk profile the whole gamut i think also alternative investments can be uh, advantageous for those that are ready however they can hurt a little bit if that uh if all those considerations aren't discussed up front what's one of the last uh, nuggets of information you'd like to give to the consumer audience about about alts that you hear often and you just, you just want to pass along to the public. Well, there's a couple of misconceptions about the alt space. Number one is there's a whole host of people who think that like alts don't perform well, but just fundamentally misunderstand kind of the role that they play and why they would be in a portfolio. Um, you know, as I stated earlier, they're not there to be your excess return. They're there to kind of manage the risk. So you can take risk in places where you have a better chance of better excess returns. Um, there are opportunities in certain types of alt, yes. But I think the number one thing I would want people to take away from this discussion today is that if there was one theme of everything we discussed, it's that everything about alts requires you to have a good conversation with your client that can provide you with the ability to get to know your client better, grow and build that relationship, make your uh, client feel heard, and potentially um, gather more assets from those clients, those things uh, like a sports rights fund, you might not realize your client has some extra liquidity somewhere or it's with someone else until you give them an idea where they want to put money to work and ha bring it into you. These are all ways to have good discussions with your clients. And again, the research shows that the vast majority of clients don't feel like their financial advisors have a connection with them or care. And so they would leave in a heartbeat for an advisor they felt did. So if you wanna stand out from your peers, if you wanna differentiate yourself, if you want your clients to feel heard, these conversations are the ways to do it. And really alternatives provide you sort of the foundational way to have the discussions because you're not gonna have them in the traditional stuff. You're just not. Mm. Those are all gems right there. And folks, when you're listening to consumer households, when Shana's talking about advisors and differentiation. Uh, we do that here at Concurrent. That's why we are partnered up with folks like Shana. And we love getting into feelings and finances to help you flourish. Shana, thank you for coming on and chopping it up about alts. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, before I let you go, though, where can people find you as far as following your handles on social? Because you got some good social out there. I, I'd like to think I do. So you can find me on X formerly Twitter. Um, it's just my first name, Shana S621. I wish I ch could change it, but at this point, it's been my handle forever. Changing it now would just confuse people. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, finance underscore queen 2020. I'm on LinkedIn under Shana Sissel. Um, all of all of the places you can find me, um, just uh, put in Shana Sissel and you will absolutely find me. Um, all of my accounts are verified. So if you find a Shana Sissel and it's not a verified account, it is not me. Uh, so uh, yep, connect with me in all of those places. I am very active on social as Preston knows. <laughs> cool beans. Well, thanks again, Shana. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All, all right, folks, if you like what you've seen, heard and feel on the show, please like it, share and subscribe to your peers and colleagues and friends. 
and come back to the show next time where we'll be chopping it up about another subject. Cheers.